all right so uh, please in the last class uh, quiet in the last class please note the question that uh, towards the end saroni has asked a question and i have answered her i have given some examples important for you to understand even the policy debate yeah. uh, we mentioned an important policy principle of freedom of contract which is a feature of most of the developed countries actually the technical because the term has become set in the policy debate as freedom of contract but actually it should be freedom to contract to be strictly correct in english but just say freedom of contract because that's how it's been understood in the policy debate so i've given us some examples which you can relate to what is meant by freedom of contract i gave examples of the swiggy discounts the amazon discounts which the government is trying to crack down on yes. so please uh, try and understand this principle of policy the policy debate that we had on that particular principle everything that i've discussed with you basically emanates from from some principles okay so understand that watch that uh, listen to that last part of the part where she's asking this question and i've answered her okay so let's go back now so we have already covered uh, this so we covered the part which talks about uh, the two differences we looked at the differences between exchange traded and otc markets and then we looked at uh, this was 26 and then we ended the segment okay by talking about those two differences which i'll just briefly go through but you should cover that on your own the second part we discussed first is how uh, we are blurring the distinctions on the on the point of uh, the management of credit risk and we discuss three different um, three different ways uh, in which that is happening collateralization in bilateral situations and then uh, bilateral collateralization situation uh, initiatives like cme clearport and then the ccp which the regulators are imposing on the uh, otc market participants and standardized contracts okay and then we are also talking about we also talked about flex options which the cme is using which is basically an example of how exchanges are trying to reach out to the otc market participants and bring them to the exchange space okay so just this finishes this topic i've given you an optional topic which is basically an, a further development of this point the, the second point we discussed on this topic is the blurring of the distinctions new developments okay and then what are the limitations on the blurring of the distinctions it may be a little bit difficult to understand so i've left it as an optional topic if you want you can read it okay basically it, it because it's it's, uh, it's about the point of standardization of contracts so unless you standardize the contract you can't have it becomes difficult to clear it centrally okay so to the extent that you have high customization in otc contracts that becomes a limitation on uh, you know using central counterparties or any other kind of centralized clearing system because for that you need a fairly standardized contract okay so the more customized the contract the less uh, less amenable it is the more difficult it becomes to bridge to bridge the uh, blur the distinction on point number four which is the credit risk uh, intermediation okay so this is anyway as an opt optional topic you can read this for yourselves now our next topic i'll just briefly cover you, uh, cover this for you because you guys are actually going to be doing a project which is uh, okay so this is quite big do i have let's do 50 percent and then uh, zoom in oh my god it's too okay i'll just explain this to you this framework has been put uh, this framework has been put into your folder so you can have a look at it so there's no need for you to uh, look at it in detail okay i mean to note it down just try to understand the schema here this is not working out very well i think we'll go to 50 percent and then <laughs> all right and everyone can see this now what is garvit looking at let's have garvit's phone also let's have garvit give me the phone as well garvit's phone quickly quickly can everyone see shreya can you read the writing tax legal and regulatory puneet can you read the writing <laughs> okay got it got it got it okay i understand i understand the problem the colors should not be there so <laughs> 
uh, format options uh, it's very difficult now to fix this okay let's t let me just tell you something one minute uh, when you read it when you see it at home you'll be able to get it done one sec uh, let me not okay let's let's not uh, let me see if I can do something about the colors okay oh here it is okay here it is no it's not working out it's not working out okay let's I don't know how I did this but let's not yeah, yeah I'll just tell you guys okay please try and pay attention try to understand here what is happening uh, how much can you actually read okay so you can't read the activities but you can read the other stuff right you can read increase risk and reduce risk yes that that stuff you can read <laughs> It's just become too. Um, <laughs> what happened? Okay, guys, now let's just one sec, one sec. I'm not able to manipulate this picture now. Okay, let's just try and understand quickly what it is, just for your own understanding. Okay, uh, I'll read out the segments to you. What are you working on, Shivam? What are you working on? Okay. All right, guys, please pay attention. Try to understand the scheme here. What is, is just to show you guys because you make sure that you guys understand what the functions of the treasurer. So here we are just going to call it CFO because it's a much smaller word. Okay. So in a large corporation, you might have both a CFO and a treasurer. The CFO will tend to concentrate more on. Uh, you know account preparation and those kinds of things whereas the, uh, and uh, maybe some of the the tax uh, tax related matters as well whereas the treasurer will tend to focus on the f fundraising and the cash management and those aspects okay so when you see it on your f uh, on, on your laptop uh, you'll be able to see it clearly so what we have written down here is basically the, this I'll just read out the stuff that you can't see properly so this is called this is written as funding business units these these things are actually the activities which the CFO has to do these things in yellow and the one in blue is the activities that the CFO has to do okay so when I say CFO it's an ag aggregate of CFO treasurer everything combined so this is capital raising this is funding business units this is cash management and this is risk management okay and this is tax legal and regulatory so I'm sorry the fonts are not good the, not big enough and so you can't see it but anyway so these are the activities now there's a reason why I put this in blue the reason this is in blue is because this is written for MBA students okay so tax legal and regulatory one of the jobs of the CFO one of the functions of the CFO uh, that whole group of people is tax legal and regulatory and that includes preparation of financial statements which is a big activity actually okay preparing the financial statements is a big activity in any CFO operation and that is covered under regulatory because most of those are regulatory filings okay so the financial statement preparation is either covered under tax also sometimes you have two PNLs one tax PNL and one uh, management PNL and for reporting PNL because tax laws may give you some other kinds of benefits so you have all that is covered under regulatory financial statement preparation is prepared covered under tax legal and regulatory the reason that's in blue is because those jobs are not given to MBAs those are usually given to either LLBs or CAs so you are a qualified lawyer or a qualified accountant and then you get those jobs in those departments okay so tax legal and regulatory has therefore been put in blue okay and the other activities which are given to MBAs when you go into a corporate treasury corporate uh, CFO operation those are put in yellow okay which is here once again I'm repeating funding business units capital raising uh, cash management and risk management okay so the scheme here is just to show you how the activities of the CFO uh, are intertwined with the objectives of the firm okay that is the whole idea about this frame of this framework okay so you don't have to note anything it's in your in your folder so what we have tried to show here is how the firm is caught between uh, you know caught having to walk a tightrope it's an uh, it's caught between conflicting objectives the first objective obviously every firm is a profit making most of them are profit making organized profit oriented organizations so they have to grow earnings to make money right and so to grow earnings you have to increase risk or reduce risk 
you have to increase risk because if you want to make more money you have to increase risk like any coffee let's say a barista like a coffee chain has to wants to increase earnings it will have to set up a new outlet one of the things it will do is set up a new outlet which has certain fixed costs and when you set up a new outlet you have no real guarantee as to whether how much money that thing is going to make okay you don't know what the footfall will be how much people will spend on average nothing is really known for certain but what is certain is your costs when you take a lease you can't take a lease for like 15 days so you have to take a lease for one year at least maybe okay so you have to your one year lease rentals are certain then you have to hire employees all the you can't hire people for seven days so you'll have to hire employees so all those costs are locked in and all your sort of overheads are locked in and th those are guaranteed but your revenues are not guaranteed okay so that's the basic risk of any business okay so you have to take risk so what we have tried to show here is that when the firm tries to grow earnings it has to increase risk okay i don't know if you can read the increase risk here can you read it fully yes, you can read it okay all right so when to grow earnings you have to increase risk okay but then you can't just try to grow earnings like our good friend kingfisher airlines okay uh, or uh, people like ilfs all these people who got into trouble okay and uh, i think once some recent what is the other company that recently got into Car trouble Carvey stock problem firm is also facing some issues. Carvey, Carvey is actually that's a compliance failure. DHF. That's a com they haven't like gone bankrupt. Sir, DHF. but they have actually. DHFI is also another example. Yeah. Sir, sir they, they have compliance issues, but what they what they did was they took the money of their clients. Yeah. The securities of their clients. Okay, quiet, quiet. One minute, person is speaking. Give her the mic. No, sir. Okay. Okay. Why? Why you don't like the mic? Now use the mic. What is the problem? You feel shy using the mic. You have to get used to it. No, no. You have to get used to it. You can't be shy using the mic. You're a business student. You're an MBA student. Next time we'll make you conduct the freshers party or something. So you have you have to get used to it. You can't be shy about it. Okay. Okay. One minute. Keep be quiet, please. Yeah. So we're saying that what they did was they took the securities uh, of the clients, they transferred it on their name, and then borrowed loan a loan from uh, banks and other financial institutions. So that was the kind of fraud what they did. Yeah. So there are all kinds of problems there, mm -hmm. and the first compliance problem is as a securities firm, you have to understand there's always in most countries there is a bar on commingling uh, client funds with the firm's money mm -hmm. okay so when you have client funds like we showed you that day the clearing firm says system remember when you're trading with brokers yeah. on the stock market okay so those brokers are members of the stock market stock exchange clearing house either your broker directly or you're dealing with an ib and then the ib has an account with the clearing firm but the rule always is that even the clearing house cannot commingle uh, i mean the clearing house doesn't do any proprietary trading but the clearing members cannot commingle the client funds with their own funds so that's one mistake that they've made and then the other stuff which they've done is even bigger problems so anyway okay so the point i was trying to make is that you can't just keep on taking risk and get end up like kingfisher airlines okay so you have to also uh, focus on what we call staying solvent okay are you following this the other objective is to you have to also stay solvent while you want to make money you have to also make sure that you're solvent okay solvent means that you must have enough cash to pay your debts as they come due not with the rescheduling of debts or something but with as they come due through your own money that is available to you okay that you should be so st staying solvent when you want to focus on solvency do you need to reduce risk or increase risk when you want to focus on staying solvent do you reduce risk or increase risk reduce. you reduce risk okay so what we're trying to show here is basically that the firm is caught between two conflicting objectives mm -hmm. every firm has to try and grow earnings okay there's tremendous pressure especially if you're a public company there's tremendous pressure to grow earnings so to grow earnings you have to keep on taking risk okay and, and similarly uh, at the same time while you're growing earnings you have to also keep an eye on solvency okay hey why are you taking your phone well, keep it here <laughs> don't go out you're very restless we'll have to you know like, don't and don't come back quickly <laughs> so um again he left the room okay we'll have to put a bar on him going out now okay 
uh, okay guys all right now what would I say okay so all we are trying to show here is to show you how and then we'll see how the CFO's activities are intermingled with this okay are connected to this so the firm has conflicting objectives on the one hand it has to grow earnings and to do that it has to increase risk on the other hand it has to focus on staying solvent which all requires you to reduce risk okay so that you have not taking too much risk and you don't go uh, bankrupt or you uh, you know don't go into insolvency so there's a conflicting objective now look at this while how do the connection how do the activities of the CFO mesh in with the objectives of the firm okay so when you try to grow earnings there are two types of growth organic and inorganic you guys know the difference yes Anjum tell us the difference on what is the difference in organic and inorganic growth give us a mic you're going to go into corporate treasury right so give us a uh, lowdown on uh, uh, on and uh, um, Gulati is laughing so he'll tell us after uh, Anjum no, let you let him you answer first. Sir, Gulati will go into the IT side. He's not going to go in corporate treasury. Okay, answer. What is the answer? Sir, can you please ask a question from IT? Uh, One minute. Request, sir. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. Go, Anjum, you don't know? Organic versus inorganic growth, you don't know? Haven't you guys done a course on uh, M&A? No, no, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Give the mic. Okay. Quiet, quiet. Anjum, give the mic to Chuk. Give the mic to Chuk. Yes, quiet. Everybody quiet. Yeah. What is the difference between organic and inorganic growth? So, like the growth is uh, supported by then the growth is supported by uh, acquiring another company it is known as inorganic growth okay uh, and organic growth means that you have uh, grown on the basis of your retained earning on the basis of your uh, it simply means you have grown apart from acquisition okay okay yeah so you could have explained it a little better but you have understood the concept so organic growth means that growth it's like just apple is setting up another of apple is setting up another apple store opens an apple store in bangalore okay which never existed so that is organic growth because apple is remaining apple but apple is just expanding the scope of its operations so it sets up a new store in bangalore a new store in uh, jaipur okay these are examples of organic growth where the company is expanding through its own up by expanding its own operations inorganic growth is if apple buys let's say a, a swatch which is a watch company okay swiss watch company so if apple buys swatch okay and tries to blend their you know come out with now fa fancy watches and stuff and thereby increases its sales that is called or inorganic growth because they're actually go coming through the growth is coming through the growth of another company okay is this clear okay so it's kind of natural and you can think of m a as a slightly unnatural activity which is it requires some effort to acquire a company whereas natural growth is happening on its own okay so you can relate it to uh, on inorganic on organic and inorganic chemistry which you studied it so now have you understood organic versus inorganic you mean to say this was never taught to you yes everyone's forgotten okay all right okay. so now here once again guys please come back to the uh, schema okay try to understand how the objectives of the firm so you see growing earnings is one of the objectives and there are two ways to grow earnings either organically or inorganically okay in both cases you need to have capital raising you need to raise capital because either you grow if your apple is opening a new store in bangalore they need money for that okay so you need to either have that money or you need to raise that money so capital raising is associated with both types of growth organic and inorganic inorganic also if a company like now there's a uh, uh, you may not have heard about it but there's a company uh, there's a big online brokerage called charles schwab in the u.s and so as finance students you should be aware of it charles schwab is going to buy uh, TD Ameritrade which is another online brokerage okay so uh, and then there's another big merger also that has uh, come in which uh, I'm forgetting the industry but uh, th there's another big merger which came out before this okay so these mergers keep happening so when Schwab is buying Ameritrade they need to that that merger is worth I think what they have to pay about 16 billion dollars okay so some of that will be paid through debt usually 
okay so you need to raise capital to ra to fund that acquisition okay so schwab may not have the money with itself so it may have to raise money by going going into the debt capital markets okay and raising money so you can see that capital raising is it very confusing for you guys that i'm saying capital raising but you can't read it yeah is it okay can you manage okay so this part is capital raising so this is one of the activities that are required that is uh, required of the cfo okay in order to fund both inorganic and organic growth in both cases you need capital raising so this is one of the hard, uh, one of the most important activities of the cfo raising capital because everybody is hungry for capital okay so this is a very very important activity and the second one is uh, on this side which you can see which applies really to uh, the organic growth side which is funding business units okay this you have already done in your fm1 fm2 i don't know which one but your capital budgeting exercises which you did okay so when you fund business units like if you have a general electric which has many many divisions okay so many of their divisions will submit their capital plans for the next year and the cfo office in general electric will evaluate the plans see which ones are meeting the hurdle rate for the internal irr or whatever which is generating a larger npv so this all this stuff cut that you guys did in capital budgeting okay all those skills evaluating project analysis and all that that goes into this kind of activity where the cfo has to decide because there may be lots of demands for money but <coughs> you may not have that much money available so you have to do some rationing right so there may be demands for 15 billion dollars of new projects but you may have access to only maybe 9 billion dollars so you have to decide which one to take and which one to reject all right so that's where all your so you have to connect your learning to the activities of the cfo all the stuff you guys did in the capital budgeting npv irr all that stuff that goes into this kind of activity where you use those skills to evaluate proposals from the business units okay you understand business units okay a big company like ge will have ge will have an aerospace aerospace division because they have they make aircraft engines right <coughs> they'll have a medical equipment division etc <laughs> okay so is this part clear so far yes, that we are connecting the activities of the cfo to the objectives of the firm and the activities of the firm the objective is to grow earnings one of the objectives you grow it either organically or inorganically both cases you need to raise capital so capital raising is one of the most important activities of a cfo and the second is that uh, you have to do some analysis evaluate the various project proposals mm -hmm. and you have to fund the business units okay so that's the other activity this you have already covered okay on this side on staying solvent you have two elements one is cash management one is risk management cash management i'll give you some risk i'll, I'll give you some links but we won't have time to cover it because we want to go for depth rather than breadth so we'll cover risk management and capital raising in detail all right okay so on the staying solvent side one of the most important activities is risk management this part is risk management okay this part is risk management so here you have to manage your risk all kinds of risks which you will see when you get to do the case uh, which we are going to do in this project in this case in this course uh, you'll see what kinds of risk a company faces but you already are familiar with the various types of risks yes. what are some of the risks we discussed yes. right market risk credit risk etc and remember that when you if you go back to your market risk readings if you go back to your otc one of the things that you have to remember is Seems not doesn't seem to be responding. Okay, when you go back here, you can see that um, I think towards the yeah market risk is further classified. Okay, when you are talking about market risk, so most important types of risk are market risk and credit risk. But uh, legal and regulatory, like what has happened in the case of Carvey is a legal and regulatory risk it's basically a compliance risk okay they have failed on this point okay so then you can have operational risk also where you can end up sometimes people have seen there have actually been cases of remittances being sent for trillions of dollars when it was supposed to be millions because people added extra zeros okay so these kinds of things happen actually there was also a case on the uh, deutsche termin boss uh, electronic exchange where a trader was sitting and relaxing like this and his finger elbow was on the sell button and he kept on selling contracts <laughs> and the market went into a tailspin because the he sold so many contracts that everybody got spooked and started selling so this actually happened on the it's a frankfurt exchange deutsche it was called used to be called dtb then it got taken over by urex so this actually happened that the guy was sitting there so these are all examples of what we call operational risk 
okay so you have to be very careful so now um, legal and regulatory I've seen financing we've talked about a little bit so market and credit risk are two of the most important ones okay in your project we'll be dealing with market risk so market risk also remember when you're dealing with market risk okay you will also have to further split it we go back to our uh, framework here okay so when you are actually a market risk manager so one of the job designations uh, one of the job descriptions that you will find in the industry in, in many many financial institutions is uh, risk management okay so various types of risk manager credit risk manager and market risk management if you're if you're a market risk manager usually in the big organizations because the trading books are so big uh, they will classify it as a fixed income market risk manager foreign exchange market risk manager commodities market risk manager all right they will split it up because the books are so big that you can't have one guy looking at everything okay but the concept in market risk is the moment you go into market risk management you have to then visualize this kind of a framework where you are actually uh, typically if you're a foreign exchange manager okay foreign exchange risk manager currency risk manager you'll have to look at the spot trading book you'll have to look at the futures trading book the forwards book the swaps book and the options book and in a very big organization you may have separate risk managers for each of the books okay so for every uh, so you'll have to look at the uh, uh, so the point is that the moment you think about market risk management you have to recall this framework because market risk management when you have put it actually you have to put it into practice you will have to go like this you will have to go by asset class and then you'll have to go by the market instrument combination okay so you may have basically for the major currencies you may have somebody looking at the FX option book so FX options risk manager for the G10 currencies okay so the major G10 uh, currency pairs okay so those are your markets and your instrumental options and you're confined to this and then you look at the various apps aspects of the option trading book so the idea is when you look at market risk you have to immediately go back to this kind of a framework and further look at market risk comprehensively like this across all the asset classes across all the markets and instruments are you following this is the idea behind market risk because you may be running all kinds of books okay book you understand what I mean by book yes, sir. this position that you have that's called a trading book okay so in common to uh, many people in industry in the fan in, in especially the banks and invest and the trading floors you this will be referred to as a, a, a risk book okay so they will typically ask you when you're interviewing for a position one of the questions they may ask you is remember what I told you about traders trading sales trading and research remember I told you sales trading and research yes. you've forgotten that now in any market making operation which you will find market making operations you can find in a commercial bank treasury as well and you can also find in an investment bank trade or an investment bank trading flow okay remember the market making operation which we discussed what everybody's forgotten that yes you remember sales trading research what happened why are the responses are so muted why are the, why are the responses so muted so in sales trading and research the one of the questions that people will ask you if you want to because many people in, just blindly say I want to do I banking because they've heard that the salaries are very good okay so you have to understand the role requirements are all very different okay so one of the things they may ask you is what is happening here now I have to start deducting marks if I see anybody looking here and there okay because there's too much talking going on today okay all right uh, so one of the questions they may ask you is do you want to run a risk book what kind of temperament do you have do you want to be running a risk book or do you want to be in research or do you want to be in sales the temperaments are totally different the required temperament is totally different a salesman's temperament is totally different okay and a research person's temperament is different there's some overlap between trading and research because the analytical aspects is involved okay you still have to basically whether you're a research person or a trading person you will always have to be engaged in this kind of activity which is looking at a market and taking a view on which way is this going okay which way do I want to bet this is this market going up or is this market going down that view you'll have to take whether you're a research guy or a trading person okay in both cases you have to take that view but the difference in trading is you'll actually have to carry risk you have seen the situation did you guys feel uncomfortable if you were holding a position and losing money yes sir. okay so so that uh, multiply that several fold because this was not even real money so when you have actually had real money on the line that becomes much more complicated okay so the difference between trading and research really is that the research guy doesn't have to live with that heartache of having to take a position and then the thing is going against you and then uh, you're wondering 
what to do should I cut it now eat my losses or should I wait for the market to come back if you decide to wait then the market may actually not come back it may keep on getting worse right so there's no simple solution okay you have to just deal with it somehow you have to figure out a way to deal with that kind. it's a very unstructured environment okay so you have to be comfortable with that kind of environment to be a trader to, and you have to enjoy that kind of environment so people will ask you uh, where, whether you are uh, you want to run it so if you're going to be a trader they'll ask you that uh, that means you want to run a risk book this is called a risk risk book okay when you're running a trade if you're either a market maker or a speculator it's a, in the industry we say that you're running a risk book okay so uh, all right so this is the point here that we were talking about that when you do uh, when you do oh, what was the thing we looked at when you do market risk management okay you have to uh, split it up further into all these asset classes market instrument combinations okay this is the way to manage market risk okay and then you may be assigned to uh, a very very specific market instrument combination which locks you into an asset class as well if we go back to the framework now <coughs> What happened? We have to increase this a little bit. Little bit better now? <laughs> okay, now you can still read because this funding business units, I think you can read. Okay, now we were just here, okay, we were just here, which is risk management. Okay, we'll try to keep it here. So, this is risk management. That is one of the other. So, the two areas of the CFO that we're going to focus on in this course. Hopefully, we have time to get into capital raising also a little bit. But the two areas we'll be focusing on, the two most important areas are actually capital raising and risk management. Okay, cash management is not so critical, but it can also add a lot of value. But we won't have time to get into it. I'll give you some links. Funding business units, we're not getting into because you've already covered it in your FM1 when you did capital budgeting. Okay, so you've already covered it so we're not doing it so are you following now the scheme here this is really meant for your understanding so that you have a sense of how uh, what the CFO's roles are what kind of roles MBAs usually would take up if they go into corporate treasury right so uh, so the roles you would typically take up is in this kind of a situation where you're evaluating business proposals uh, business unit proposals or in capital raising or in risk management as you will see uh, you will see the uh, confirmation of what I've told you in both these cases risk management and capital raising you will have to take a call on the market okay so if you look at now tnx tnx is the us 10-year interest rate see where it is now okay so now let's say for instance this this is basically the yield on the 10-year us treasury note okay so if you are raising us dollar debt for 10 years this becomes an important factor in the calculation so you can see even this very short period of time it has ranged between around 325 to around one, one, 135 okay so 135 to 325 that's quite a big range in such a short period of time for uh, debt instruments okay that is we're talking about the interest rate all right so the u.s treasury is paying this kind of interest rate this is a range of rates 3 point, uh, 325 and 135 in this short period of time say about these two three years okay so this if you are a, uh, why is in this why did i why do i have why do i keep bringing you back to taking views on financial markets because if you are a treasurer okay if you're a cfo treasurer if you are raising capital if you're raising debt capital okay if you're raising us dollar debt capital for 10 years okay this will be one of the key benchmarks against which your cost of funding will be measured so as you can see here this market is not standing still can you see that the market is not standing still and you can also see cyclicality in this market can you see that almost not really almost a perfect circle but somewhere there okay some element of cyclicality you can see starts from a low level goes up and then kind of comes back okay so the stuff is moving around and this is going to determine the way that corporate debt is sold is basically as a spread to treasury so you will have to see they will see what uh, let's say if you're um, say IBM you're going into the market to borrow you're working for the IBM Treasury and IBM wants to borrow money for US dollar debt for 10 years they will look at first they look at okay how much uh, are we charging the US government we are charging the US government say 175 at this point of time we're charging them 175 and say with for the I for the for the debt of IBM since they're not as good as the US government we are going to charge them let's say uh, 50 basis points extra okay so you know what basis point is 50 basis points is half percent okay so then if the US government is paying 175 then IBM will have to pay to 25 okay
then when the US government rate is 325 then IBM will have to pay 375 okay so therefore your cost of debt is going to be a function of the benchmark yield that's why I keep saying that you have to keep taking views on markets because as a treasurer you are when you are going to raise capital you have some window with uh, available to you you can decide that you can raise it today you can raise it three months later or six months later okay so therefore you have to take a view if you decide to issue your debt today that means you're saying that this rate is likely to go up are you following what i'm saying why are you issuing the debt today why are you not waiting it must mean that if you are going in for an issue of debt today which means that your view is that these rates are likely to rise now unless it's a situation where you desperately need the money in which case you don't have a choice okay but if we know that you don't desperately need the money and we see that you're issuing debt today that means your view is that these rates are now likely to go up okay if you felt that the rates are likely to go down you would not be issuing it you would wait because your total cost of debt will be lower right so you can see how in capital raising which is one of the core functions of the CFO that also requires a taking a view on markets okay and the situation of the snap CFO we have already explained to you if that snap actually got snap actually snap is the parent company that owns snapchat okay so snap actually got its uh, approval they got their IPO approval in uh, they got it before the election okay so this is 2016 they got their approval somewhere I think in October yeah where is Kaneka I think she went down okay okay good. okay so uh, they got their approval sometime in mid-October okay and they could have waited through the election okay uh, or they could have done it before the election I've discussed this with you many times remember are you guys following what is being discussed <coughs> what you're looking all blank yes, sir. you are in the situation of the snap CFO yes, who has received the regulatory approval to issue a, uh, do a issue of equity shares okay so you have a choice now you have some set say you have a six month window you got your win approval in October mid October 2016 now November 2016 you know the election is coming mm. okay so people are saying that Trump will not win but if Trump wins the stock market will crash mm. okay so now you are really worried because now you don't know what to do you should you now do your cap because if you raise your capital now it's fine if the market crashes at least now you have raised a lot of money before the market crashes this is clear but if you don't raise it uh, if you don't raise money right now and then the market cash crashes then you're in trouble because people will say you're an idiot okay but then if you decide to raise capital now and then as we saw Trump won and both the predictions went wrong okay he won and the stock market started rising okay so in any case if you decided for some reason to do the issue before the election and then the stock market started rising then people will still say to you well you're such an idiot you should have waited mm -hmm. okay so hindsight is always 2020 as they say so as a treasurer you never really have as a CFO you never really have any peace no matter what you do people will be second guessing you after the fact and saying well you're such a fool you should have seen that you should have waited you should have seen that uh, you should have waited and let the market rise okay mm -hmm. so the point is that whenever you whenever because obviously are you able to follow that you get a higher valuation of the stock market overall is higher every company gets a higher valuation right so the point is here that the point here is that in capital raising you have to continuously take views on markets okay whether you're raising equity capital or debt capital that is why in these finance electives I force you guys to look at actually to to manage port, uh, you know portfolios and risk books uh, to get a feel for how markets actually move so that you can develop your own way of navigating markets are you following okay all right so we have established this point so one of the important jobs is risk management and whether you're managing uh, we'll come to risk management how, how it's relevant but essentially capital raising you have to take a view on markets and risk management also as you will see you will be required to take a view on markets when you're managing a, a what we call a passive risk book okay so is this point clear now this framework is clear yes. okay so uh, it's just meant to give you an understanding of how the firm has different obje conflicting objectives and how the and what the main roles in treasury corporate treasury are okay so so now we'll try to move on to our next topic which is basically understanding futures contracts okay so we have
so we have this uh, reading given to you let's first open your uh, what happened now you are also going out you already have two people out <laughs> okay go go no, find out what it is. okay go 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 let's not let's not uh, this class has become very uh, this the class has become very rowdy now give give us tarun's phone also he's also looking down he's also looking down give us his phone also give the phone here give it here put it here go back and just bring them back quickly okay put it here put it on silent and put it here my phone shop is doing great business okay all right all right okay one minute um this is otc but let's go to um, let's go to futures okay. so what is your futures we'll start with um, we have given you a reference of 2.1 okay guys now we are not going to start futures contracts because you're going to be using futures contracts for your project okay so you have to understand futures contracts very well please study these projects i've given you the six contracts okay what i'll do is i'll leave out the euro dollar because you guys have a lot of other uh, you, you'll have to let's at least deprioritize that we won't be using the euro dollar but we will have it as part of the uh, this is why i tell you to always say if you are referring to the currency if you are if you are trying to refer to the currency that is if you're trying to refer to this okay then you should always use the word your your expression should be yeah uh, then you let her go then you tell her go okay 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 take her take her. Go, go go both of you can go okay but uh, when you see yash send him back <laughs> <laughs> he, he, yeah i i don't think you need yash also to take <laughs> okay <laughs> send them back okay so this is why i keep saying that if you are referring to the foreign exchange markets if you are referring to euro dollar in the foreign exchange markets you must always use the expression euro dollar fx okay because there's also something else called the euro dollar which is basically the euro dollar futures okay these are futures on 3 month euro dollar deposits which are euro deposits 3 month euro dollar deposits in london so to avoid confusion between the interest rate contract which is also called euro dollars okay so you should always when you are referring when your intention is to refer to foreign exchange you should always say euro dollar fx fx will indicate currencies so that is meant to distinguish between uh, the euro dollar uh, futures interest rate contract okay so this we are going to discuss as part of the case and the risk management on the in the in the uh, on the balance sheet but uh, we will not be using this particular contract in the in the project so i've just put the others in bold so please make sure you understand these contracts read all the contract specs i'm not going to cover all the contract specs in detail and whenever you're trading any futures contract your responsibility is go is to go to the website of the particular exchange in this case we are dealing with the cme group because cme's group is huge okay they basically gobbled up all kinds of exchanges they used to be cme they gobbled up cbot they gobbled up nymex they gobbled up comex okay all kinds of exchange that is a huge group actually one of the biggest probably the biggest exchange uh, uh, you know company in the world so uh, they have all kinds of different markets okay so you have uh, the, the objective is always any any futures contract that you are trading you have to go to the relevant exchange and look up if you are going to trade let's say if you are going to trade corn futures you have to go to the corn page and then look up the contract specifications okay and understand exactly what exact what is exactly what is it that you are actually trading okay so you can see the full contract specs okay so this is what you should be doing as an exercise in any uh, in any uh, futures trading activity yes what is the problem so what will we uh, what will we be trading i you will be trading this i've already given you contracts needed for project okay so these are maybe you can't read it here you can read it right okay can you read crude oil copper crude oil gold japanese yen currency futures and australian dollar currency futures okay no no there is how can you have a market without any have a market with only one asset <laughs> So Australian dollar, it is understood that the other side is US dollars. Okay, 
so the point is that in in foreign exchange typically the most liquid part of the foreign exchange marketplace is this actually if you look at this once you look at and so when you're looking at any particular market you will also have to see in currencies the most liquid part is actually the spot market okay so typically the when you manage risk in foreign exchange uh, when you manage foreign exchange risk the preferred way to do it is used to use spot and forward markets together to manage your risk okay we hopefully will have time to discuss how that works how these markets are connected okay but in this particular case we are going to use currency futures because the accounting for spot and forward effects on this particular platform is not very uh, good according to me so we are going to use currency futures and that will give you additional uh, uh, you know flavor for currency futures. currency futures are also quite liquid but uh, they're nowhere near as liquid as the spot markets this is what you can see this is the spot market okay you'll see there's some quotation differences also so that will introduce an additional element of complication in the in the Japanese yen futures contract that will also be useful for us as a, as a learning as an aspect of our learning okay so are you following now what has to be done okay so these are the contracts please study them on your own okay needed for the project okay so we start with 2.1 and here what I've done what we'll do is we'll try to follow for the sake of uh, so this topic wise notes that you have in your folder this in futures we will refer to at certain points we will refer to the notes but by and large we'll just follow the textbook okay where there are certain mistakes somewhere and things like that so for that we'll refer to the book and we need to put in some additional material so let's go to the book and see uh, futures where we what, what have we given as a reference these are your references 2.1 so let's start with 2.1 there may be something in one also but we'll just uh, let's look at this So understand one thing very clearly, which will help you to understand futures contracts a little better. <coughs> futures are what, ETM or OTC? ATM. Okay, so futures are exchange traded instruments. You can see clearly that to figure out futures, we went to an exchange website, right? So this is an exchange, the CME group. I don't know where, maybe I closed that, uh, I closed that web uh, page. Okay, so, <coughs> So the first thing you can understand clearly is futures are uh, exchange traded instruments. Okay. So immediately everything you learned about exchange traded markets is going to apply to futures. All right. So already now you know a lot about futures contracts yes. because you know how the thing is going to work. The margining system is clear to everybody yes. that every day's losses and uh, profits have to be paid in. Yes. Okay. And uh, received. All right. So let's just look at it. So your reference is basically uh, 2.1 to 2.4. Okay, so let's start with 2.1. So this is just general stuff. And also, please remember all your textbooks. I'm repeating this warning once again. Okay, Garvit, try to stay awake. I just half more, one half hour more. Okay. No, 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 no. The class started at 3:45. One minute. 3:45 plus one and a half hours. Is 5:15. One minute. No, no. One sec. One sec. Don't create. One sec. Be quiet now. There's no. Don't create unnecessary uh, problems. It's very clear. The class starts at 3:45. It will end at what? 5:15. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So one minute. Now, uh, please remember for all your textbooks, all the three textbooks that you'll be receiving, you already got two. I think maybe you got the third one also. That Shapiro Moles. No, no. You got only the IPM. No, IPM, one minute. IP IPM onwards. From IPM onwards, you should have got two books by now at least. You got all three? Okay. All three books, one minute. It's quiet okay quiet now now it is your responsibility in all the three books to dig out everything where there's a reference to Indian markets okay the structure of these books is the structure of these books is that there is uh, some material there's some technical material given by the foreign author okay and then the Indian author is just adding the material on Indian markets okay 
So it is your responsibility. I'm not going to teach you the Indian markets because that is just information. What is traded on M MCX, SX? What is traded on NSC? Okay. So that is just information, but it is your responsibility to acquire that information. That is also part of your learning. Okay. Like one of your super seniors one day told me three, four batches back that uh, oh, in India we don't have any commodity futures. Yes. Which is not correct. Okay. So you must have the right information as well. All right. So uh, it is your responsibility to read up all the Indian market segments in all your textbooks and if you have any questions then you can ask me all right okay so I'm not going to cover that so this is also just information all right okay please read this uh, this is just telling you how to read all this stuff okay please read this point of about the uh, delivery of a futures contract okay so if I give you a material if you if I give you a material then um, you have to read the business snapshots as well okay so read this what happens with physical delivery so read all this stuff yes. I'm not going to go into any of this uh, stuff here yes um, <laughs> Closing out position. So you understand what is meant by closing out positions? Okay, this is sometimes also referred to as squaring a position. Is this clear? Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, this. Okay. Now specification of a futures contract. This is what you get from here. Okay. If you go back to your notes here. If you go back to this note uh, here, let's look at uh, let's look at copper. Let's look at contract. Look. P Quiet, no noise please, no, no talking. Next time anybody talks, I'll have to straight away deduct marks. Don't, uh, there's too much talking going on in the class. So here are copper contract specs. So what this book is telling you is essentially the specification you have to understand. Any futures contracts, uh, any futures contract, looking at the contract specs is a first level activity to make yourself familiar with the contract, how it works, okay? So uh, here obviously they've talked about, okay? The asset, okay, what is the underlying asset? Okay, so if you know whether it's corn or frozen concentrate, orange juice, you can have futures contracts, all kinds of uh, commodities, other financial assets, okay. So um, you see all this. So the asset is one part of it, obviously. One is the contract size. This is, let's look at some of this. So the asset we know here already is copper, okay. The particular base asset that we are talking about is copper. Contract size is the second thing. So you will read all this stuff on your own. Okay, I'm not going to just handhold you and read all this stuff. Yes. Okay, so you read this contract size is another element of the contract that you have to be aware of. Okay, what is the contract size in copper? It's 25,000 pounds. Okay, so 25,000 pounds and then you have to look at the delivery arrangements. Okay, now there are two types of uh, delivery arrangements that you might have okay so this they are talking already about physical delivery but understand one thing about futures contracts which is that you can have two types of delivery okay let me uh, let me address this this is already in your notes but this you have to understand okay settlement of the futures contract how is it settled okay in certain contracts you will see that uh, this is an important point to understand so when you're trading any contract one thing you should notice is what is the settlement method is there physical delivery involved or is it what we call cash settled or is it financially settled okay so look at the delivery mode here if they've mentioned anything here what does it say under settlement method deliverable okay deliverable means this is physical delivery is allowed in this contract there are certain types of contracts where you will see that it will say we can look it up and see okay we can look at uh, we'll just launch something else s p 500 see it's already there in your notes okay let's look at this s p 500 futures contract this is a big contract actually there's an e-mini version as well here uh, e-mini is just a contract size they have short they have uh, reduced the contract size because contract size you know it has a big impact on how expensive the contract is mm -hmm. because if you are minimum if i force you to trade and say 100 million dollars worth in the dollar yen market then every time a little bit of movement is also going to cost you a lot of money if i'm forcing you to trade in 100 million dollar lots okay but if I allow you to trade and say half a million dollar lots, your risk is much less for the movement. Okay. So notice the difference here. In one case, in the S&P 500 contract, what does it say here? Can you read this? Financially settled, you can read. Okay. 
so one is saying financially settled which means here you can't go and because see s p 500 also has an underlying asset okay so the underlying asset here in the s p 500 contract is the s p 500 index so you could say that you know I, you could technically it's uh, at first glance it may seem like then okay fine i'll trade this futures contract but when it comes to settling the contract i will buy all the stocks in the s p 500 in proportion and i'll deliver it okay i'll deliver those individual stocks right all the component 500 stocks i'll deliver against the contract okay so uh, and i'll multiply it by 250 and i'll deliver it against the contract for each contract okay but i'll actually deliver the underlying stocks but actually you're not allowed to do that because the reference asset see just like when you're trading copper when you're trading copper futures you are allowed to physically deliver settlement method is deliverable it means basically physical delivery so against this you can see that you have the ability to develop a delivery period then you have grade look at this grade one or grade one electrolytic copper cathodes full plate it's everything is given here if you deliver these copper cathodes against the short position the exchange will accept it because in this contract it says settlement uh, it says settlement method is deliverable so physical delivery is allowed so in this futures contract when you trade this futures contract you are allowed to deliver physical copper against this contract because this contract is on copper yes. okay so the settlement the moment it says settlement method is deliverable okay so the, immediately you know that you can deliver physical copper against this contract to settle this contract if you have sold the contract you have to deliver when you sell something you have to deliver it when you buy something you have to receive it and whatever you have sold you have to deliver so if you have sold copper using this futures contract one option you have is you can deliver the physical copper this is clear so the first thing to note is on the delivery aspect of it on the settlement method mainly we are talking about settlement method okay whether it's physical whether physical delivery is allowed or whether it's not allowed okay so in the case of the copper contract you can see that physical delivery is allowed okay settlement method deliverable means it's it's physical delivery is allowed but here you see in the case of the s p 500 the settlement method it says financially settled which means they are not going to allow physical delivery you can't deliver the underlying stocks in the s p 500 okay we will financially settle this contract which means that we will find out how much money you have made or lost and we will just accept that set we will accept or uh, receive or pay that difference it will be settled in money terms is this clear okay so this is an important aspect of the delivery uh, of the settlement method that we are talking about okay so this is already mentioned in your notes let's see what else is there in your notes on the point of physical delivery okay so delivery arrangements so typically when you look at a futures contract you will see that it has various delivery months associated with it okay if you want to look at this you can see the best example i think is crude oil where you see lots of contract months trading yeah. all right what is happening here what is the talk why is that the, the noise coming from here okay so when we go to a futures contract on the cme you have various options settlements volume time and sales margins you can look at quotes if you look at quotes um let's give it some time to load you'll see that it trades for there are quotes for different months okay so here can you see the jan feb can you read that part last bench you can read jan feb march 20 april 20 yes, you can read it yes, okay so you can see these are so what is what is this book talking about here the book is talking about delivery month okay so the point about futures contracts which we already noted once when we are looking at futures and forwards we noted that when you're looking at futures prices or forward prices there isn't just one price there are many many prices each price corresponds to a particular delivery period so essentially in terms of our earlier learning we talked about transaction dates and settlement dates all right so the point is that here in the case of futures and forwards you have many many settlement dates up many settlement date options are available okay in the case of futures because it's an exchange traded contract so it's standardized so you will have some fixed settlement dates okay but in the case of forwards as i told you they're otc products so you have flexibility so you can actually request any any settlement date that you want 
but the point is that in both futures and forwards there are many many settlement dates possible unlike spot which spot is basically referring to only one type of settlement date which is t usually t plus two business days okay there are some exceptions but generally it's T plus two business days. So that is one of the differences between spot and forwards and futures. Forwards and futures, you can have many. So you can see here delivery months, okay, and price codes, okay. So you can see here that here you see the prices. I don't know if you can see the prices. Jan is 5853, Feb is 20, uh, 5846. You can see the prices. Yes. So each price is different. Each price is different, okay. So the, so the prices for different uh, periods are all different, okay which will also make sense because you have concepts like time value of money which tell you essentially that any cash flow you have a, I mean it has to be uh, matched to one if you want to bring it to one point you have to adjust for the time value of money right so prices for different maturities are all different that should make sense sometimes by coincidence by a strange coincidence everything could be the same theoretically that is also possible you can't rule it out but in general you would expect them to be different okay all right so this is one point about the delivery months is there anything spe specific that they talked about in delivery arrangements yeah so they're telling you where the delivery arrangements always notice that when you have physical delivery you have to notice where the delivery is going to happen sir yeah yeah okay you can go okay here when you click on uh, so the point is here when you're looking at delivery arrangements they will tell you one sec please focus you guys yeah <laughs> okay uh, yeah so have you shut the door fully okay all right so please note that the delivery arrangements will not only specify the exact grade of copper okay if you look at the uh, settlement procedures there's a hyperlink to settlement procedures it will also tell you which warehouse you have to deliver it at okay so everything is specified you can't just say okay i have some copper lying in gurgaon please pick it up no <laughs> you will have to deliver the copper to a particular uh, warehouse which is designated by the uh, uh, exchange okay so for that you click on if you are trading copper futures and you're interested in physical delivery you will check this uh, settlement procedures that will tell you okay where you have to deliver okay all these kinds of settlement other procedures of uh, for go physical delivery normal daily settlement they will talk about i think you'll have to see this for the rule book and see where exactly which uh, uh, exchange warehouse you, there will be an exchange warehouse mates basically the exchange will give you the specification that only delivery at these fixed locations is acceptable okay so like for instance crude oil you have to deliver at um, cushing in oklahoma the west texas intermediate crude oil that has to be delivered at a cushing uh, storage facility in cushing oklahoma okay so you can't deliver even anywhere in the u.s you can't deliver anywhere else so natural gas has to be delivered in louisiana a place called henry hub so th they have these fixed locations they will specify what grade is acceptable they will specify which warehouse is acceptable so you'll have to deliver if you want to deliver physical delivery you have to deliver only to those exchanges okay is that clear okay all right okay so what else are we doing here we are still hearing lots of noise what is happening no noise just be disciplined for 10 15 more minutes okay yes. all right guys so what is saying here what are they saying here place where place will be specified by the exchange okay you can see uh, various delivery months okay price quotes price limits okay so there is something called a price limit and a position limit so every exchange because they don't want uh, excessive concentration and people manipulating the market so what they do is they put some position limits also in place that each person can only hold so many futures contracts but this will not be a, a problem for you because most individual speculators don't reach that kind of limit and, the, and even your project uh, balance sheet is quite small because our account equity is quite small so i had to reduce the size of the balance sheet this time to trade because earlier we were using otc markets this time we are using um uh, we are using a different software so our, our equity is much smaller so i had to reduce the 
size of the balance sheet so but understand price limits and positions position limits is exchange puts a limit on your position size you can't be more than let's say 5000 any card x thousand x thousand contracts long or short no person can be more than x thousand contracts long or short there'll be one limit price limits you guys have heard of, of in uh, some of you worked on the uh, in equity brokerages you heard of this circuit breakers limit down limit up yes, nse yes. okay i think they i don't know what they're using five percent six percent something like that okay so they'll have some maybe ten percent or whatever okay so they will have every exchange tries to set some limits so what they will do is basically they'll try for every contract they will set some kind of position some contracts don't have position limits okay not every contract will have a limit in india maybe everything has a limit because we are afraid of free markets but internationally not all contracts have position uh, price limits some will have and some will not have okay so you have to be also aware of uh, price limits whether there is any price limit on this so for instance let's check in copper is there any price limit um price quotation trading hours minimum price fluctuation listed contract settlement method termination position limits price limit or circuit they've got some price limits okay so you have to check these price limits by clicking this and finding out what are the price limits in copper so these are some of the checks that you have to do uh, some of the checks that you have to perform okay and you can see here what happens okay what they they have told you read this here and try to understand what is the meaning of price limits okay so uh, so essentially what will happen is if any of the limits are hit trading will be halted any of the limits being hit trading trading will be halted so they're actually telling you please be aware of the price limits so these are some of the checks that you have to perform if you are trading in any futures contract okay you, another beauty of odc markets is in odc markets since they're not very regulated there are no price limits so you can have massive moves in uh, odc markets like in odc foreign exchange markets there are no i've seen massive moves okay which uh, because there are no limits there's no exchange to limit to limit the price moves it's a free market okay so uh, but here you have price limits many of the contracts on exchanges will have price limits so what will happen essentially is whatever be the price limits you don't have to memorize the price limits but if you're trading a particular contract you should be conscious for that particular contract a does it have price limits if it has price limits what are the price limits okay and how much has it already moved maybe it's already moved maybe the price limit is five percent either way and maybe the price has already moved uh, and there'll be a reference price set here okay so price limit is the maximum price range permitted okay when markets hit the different actions occur depending on the product traded okay markets are temporarily halt under the limits can be expanded etc so the reference price you can see on all the gold price uh, thing the limit prices yeah can you please yeah so for instance here if you see okay so here what i've given 14598 let's look at so the main idea behind price limits is that the exchange wants to control the price movement okay unlike odc markets which can move dramatically nobody's going to control anything okay so like when the i don't know if you guys have heard about the corporate i actually got caught in that time when i was just into uh, just had joined the market but uh, the point is that exchange in otc markets okay if the price moves dramatically there's nobody to control it okay you can have massive moves you can have massive gaps also okay so when you have market disruptions like there was a coup in russia in 1992 okay when the russian uh, army types basically is those their their kgb and army tries they tried to get rid of gorbachev you've heard of mikhail gorbachev he's a russian leader who was responsible for relaxing the restrictions and many people blame many of the communists many blame him for the collapse of the soviet union okay so the army tried to take him out okay and there was a coup in russia for two three days so then the dollar started rising dramatically in the foreign exchange markets and there was no limit it just started sh shooting up like you know five percent ten percent like that in a day in a few hours okay so uh, there's no limit but in the exchanges what they're trying to do is they're trying to remit dramatic price movements so what is the price we looked at 14.598 okay and let's put five percent on this what is happening here who is this now i have to finally deduct mark who is this saloni and uh, whose whose voice is this constantly hearing a voice
14,598, is that 14,598? 14,598 and let's put 5% of this. Yeah. Okay, so that's 730 basically. That's what they've shown you there. Okay, so what they're saying is if they have a reference price, okay, which is very close to the gold price now. We've just gone into this, right? So let's look at, of course, this is gold futures. So um, it's 1437 and they've got a price of... Um, 14,590, 14,600, okay. So what they're saying is this 730, so they've set this reference price, okay, they don't set it every day. So they've set this reference price, now if the price moves by 5% uh, either way, they will stop trading, which is this 730 amount, around this reference price for the gold futures, okay. So they have different, depends on, these are all the different contract months. They have not written it in English here. These are the contracts. So another thing you notice about futures contracts is these are letter codes. These are meant for like Z is for December. I also don't remember all the codes. Yes. M is for uh, March. March, I think. Yes. Uh, or M might be for June, but I'm not sure. But Z is for December. So these are these are different. These are all month uh, contract codes. These alphabet letters are all contract codes, uh, month codes basically. So different months they have a different reference price. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you have different amounts. So if any of these futures contract months that you're trading, okay, if they move plus minus by this amount, the trading will be stopped. Okay, the trading will be stopped and they'll try to see where there'll be procedures written down as to whether they'll be stopped for the day or they'll try to bring it down. Uh, they will reopen again and see whether the market comes back to normal trading ranges or not. Okay, so basically what can happen is if you have price limits and you are going long very close to the 5% limit, maybe it's already uh, moved by, you know, say 4.5% 4, 4 and then you're going short at that point. And if it actually moves a little bit beyond the 5%, then they'll halt trading. So you'll be stuck in a position where basically we say that these are the terms that we use. The market is locked limit up or limit down. Because the market is locked, the market is not functioning. Okay, there's no trading, so you can't get out. So you're short now and the market is locked limit up and you can't get out. So sometimes it will happen in commodity, especially in commodity futures. It can happen that the market is locked limit up like three, four days in a row. Because in commodity futures, you can have tremendous volatility, like you can have crop failures in coffee, you can have a frost in Brazil. Okay, there's a frost, frost in Brazil, Colombia, where places like that. You can have uh, very big moves in commodity futures. So you might have a coffee contract, which every day is opening and lock, going locked limit up. So if you're stuck in a, if you're stuck short in that kind of market, are you guys following what is going on? So if you're locked like it's like you're locked in this kind of a market, and the market is going up every day, lock limit up, lock limit up, opening again and going straight lock limit up because there's so much excess demand that the market can't function basically, and it goes straight to lock limit up, and so then you are going to be in big trouble because eventually when the market starts trading, normally the price would have moved very significantly. So you don't have a chance to execute a stop at a reasonable price. So these kind of risks, these are all aspects of risk. Okay, especially when you're trading commodity futures, you get massive volatility also on commodity futures, but you also have massive risks. Yes. Okay, all these are examples of risks. So, uh, and in OTC markets, the beauty of the OTC markets is there is no price limit. Okay. <laughs> Okay, convergence of futures to spot. Should we, one minute. Let me see if there's anything else here. No, we have, uh, this is our futures contract. Okay, let me make sure that I've covered everything for physical delivery. Okay, so for physical delivery, we look at, uh, please read this business snapshot also as we have this BS is business snapshot. Okay, yes, so three contract sheets. So I've already explained this part. Okay, that some will have financial settlement. Okay, what we call cash settled and some will be settled through physical delivery. Okay, so uh, now, okay, so in the case of physical delivery now, here there are three important concepts which you have to understand, okay, which we will uh, just try and cover this before we uh, finish today. Please try and understand, there's a mistake in your book actually, okay, in this there's a mistake in the book.
which I've uh, written out. Yeah. So I don't know if it's uh, it's showing in the ebook version. I, it may or may not. I, I think it's there in your written book as well. So first notice day definition. Just ignore the book definition. Just go with what we have given you from the CME website. Okay. So there are three important concepts that we will study today before closing. Okay. Very easy to understand. The three concepts are. Yes, sir. One minute. First and last one minute. We'll just cover this and then move on. Okay. First, first concept is position date. Position day or position date. Yes. Sir. Okay. First position. So important concept. Last trading day. First position date. We'll first understand what is position day, what is notice day, and what is delivery date. Okay. So for physical delivery futures, these are very important. So the mistake that they've made in your book is actually they have des described first position date and they have called it first notice date. So you should understand the difference here. What is happening? Quiet. What is, uh, one minute. There's the difference between what is the first position date? Very simple. The holder, the first position date is the first day that the holder of the short position this is all in your notes. Okay, you don't have to memorize, you don't have to write it down. You just have to understand the concepts. The mistake in the book, you should be able to understand the mistake in the book also. The mistake in the book is they have defined, they have actually given the definition for first position date and they have called it first notice date. Okay, that's actually a mistake. Uh, first position date is the first day on which the short position holder. So I've shorted copper and that's the first day on which I'm in a position to tell the exchange that I'm going to settle this through physical delivery. Yes. Sir. Before that F FPD, I can't do that. Yes. Sir. Before first position date, I can't give that notice to the exchange. Okay. First position and last you understand. First notice date is the first day on which the exchange can tell the long position holder that you are going to be delivered against okay if you are long that means you should make sure that you get out before the first position date uh, first notice date because first as soon as first notice date comes the exchange can catch you randomly and tell you that you are going to be delivered against your long position now you have to accept physical delivery that story about cattle futures you read that story that's what happened basically right first notice day so if you have a long position you don't want delivery make sure you get out before first position date yes, uh, first notice date okay this is clear first notice date last delivery day first and last delivery day are the days on which delivery can be paid okay so please be uh, complete the rest of your reading so that we can quickly finish the uh, future segment and then we'll go on to the case okay yes <laughs> Thank you.